You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Bulmer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit noschedulemen.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. Hi, I'm Kevin Bulmer. Thanks for finding us and for taking some time to listen. I hope you enjoy the podcast. February went by in a bit of a blur for me. Hope it did for you, too, if you're not a fan of the winter, although you could be listening somewhere tropical like, say, Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. I actually had the chance to go down there just about uh, 24 hours after I posted the podcast with Mike Mulligan. Got away to Mexico. Had never been down there before. Took me 41 years to get there, but it was worth the wait. My sweetheart Caroline and I were down in that part of the world, along with some business associates, a wonderful group of people. We had an absolutely terrific time. And one of the reasons why I enjoyed it so much is that I didn't really even feel the need to get away because I'm just uh, enjoying life and and work and everything so much uh, and was happy to come home (laughs) when the time was over. I actually wrote about it in a blog that's available on NoScheduleman.com. It's called From Contentment to Cabo and Back. And it just deals with, you know, kind of being a little bit more aware and being more present and grateful in all situations and the whole idea of, you know, wherever you go, you've got to take yourself with you. So I tried to run and hide earlier in my life from myself. I didn't see it that way then, but I think I get it now. If you're interested in that, then you can go and have a look at that blog. Also in February, got away for a couple days with my little buddy, Jaden. He's my youngest son. He's just now nine years old. Bless his heart. He's a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. For people in other parts of the world, the Toronto Maple Leafs are a very woeful, haphazard, professional hockey franchise. And I say professional very lightly, (laughs) but they're Jaden's favorite. They're my favorite, too, and one of the things that he has asked me for for each of the last two Christmases is the chance to go and see his beloved Leafs at their own arena, the Air Canada Centre in Toronto, which is just less than a couple hours from where I am. And so we went up the road and saw them and stayed overnight and went to a trampoline park the next day, and wouldn't you know it that the Leafs actually won for my little JJB. So that was fun, too. Jaden's also involved with hockey, and he's had a heavy schedule. I sound like I'm making excuses, but February just, it was kind of like click blank, and you missed it. And uh, it was tough to get another podcast up before now. Today's guest, though, Rose Cora Perry, we actually recorded this conversation. I think it was February the 23rd, and uh, we just wanted to, to time the release of this to kind of mesh with some things that Rose has going on. And I'll talk more about that in just a second before we get to the conversation with her. First, uh, just a little bit of news, some things that are coming up. Rock for Dimes is a fantastic event that benefits March of Dimes Canada. And I'm really excited to be the MC of that event. This will be the third straight year where I've done that. It's going to be happening here in London on Thursday, March the 24th at the Best Western Lamplighter Inn out on Wellington Road. They do uh, rock for dimes in markets all across Canada. Uh, the event is essentially a battle of the bands, and the bands all uh, do their best to be able to raise money and awareness for March of Dimes. It's a terrific event for a great cause. I wrote about that last year. There's a blog on my website at noschedulemancom called The Heart of Rock and Roll is Still Beating at 78 Beats Per Minute. And that's the numeral 7, the letter T, and the numeral 8. That's the name of the band that won last year, and they absolutely blew my socks off, along with the doors off the building, (laughs) figuratively. An absolutely incredible band that did a mix of their own original music and some cover songs, and I'm really excited that they're going to be back. I can't wait to see them and the other bands again. That's at Rock for Dimes in London, March 24th. While we're talking about rock, I mentioned in the last podcast about how I finally made the leap and have stated my intention to try to knock something off my bucket list, which is a collection of my own rock songs. It's a project that I call Mutineer. You can look into that at mutineer.ca, or if you're on Facebook or Twitter, just look up Mutineer Band, and uh, you'll learn more about that. As far as music is concerned, that's how I met today's guest, Rose Cora Perry. It was back in November of 2010. I had just released my acoustic CD, No Schedule Man, that summer, Uh, but I had a really rough summer. I was having some bad back problems. I had even been in the hospital for a week and had to delay the release of of my CD, was real sick for a little while as well, and had to cancel some shows that summer, and so I felt kind of obligated to 
to put something together because I was doing a fundraising and awareness building campaign for Hospice of London at that time in recognition of some very good friends of mine and, and some things that their family had been through. So I felt a responsibility to, to put another show together. And so I did that at a venue called the London Music Club here in London, Ontario, Canada in November of 2010. I wanted somebody else to be able to uh, do that show with me to kind of fill it out and, and add a little bit more of an attraction to it. And that's how I ended up finding Rose. She and I didn't know each other. We had never spoken to each other. I was never even aware of, of, of her or she of me, but we put that show together. She agreed to be a part of it, and we almost instantly got along really well. Now, the funny thing about it, and, and keep this in mind when you hear this conversation, because you're going to be able to pick up on how well we get along, uh, but she and I, prior to doing this podcast conversation, did not see each other for almost five and a half years. So we haven't even seen e- seen each other since we did that show in November of 2010, but have just kind of loosely kept in touch and uh, and, and have always known that we've been good pals and, and wouldn't be enjoying that friendship or have had the opportunity to have this conversation, which you're about to hear, if it hadn't have been for just exploring my creativity and in my case, trying to do something with my music. And when I think back about the people that I've met and the experiences that I've had, I'm really grateful for all of that. And so I guess my message for this podcast is to encourage you to explore your creative side. And that doesn't have to mean writing or singing a song or painting a painting or drawing a drawing. Creativity is just an expression of, I think, whatever makes you, you. It could be restoring a car. It could be gardening. It could be the way that you arrange furniture in a house. It could be Uh, being on a committee or sitting on a community group or uh, getting some people together at work for some social tasks or community work. So the way that the office is arranged or any of those kinds of things are all inherently creative. And I guess my advice is don't let too much more time pass by if you aren't already to give some energy to that because it's going to give you back uh, all sorts of gifts tenfold. For me, one of them has been a lot of great friends uh, and some some terrific experiences that I probably wouldn't have had if I had not explored music. And one of them is uh, Rose Cora Perry. She describes herself online as a musician, a media personality, and a model. But what I would say is that she's an absolute force of nature. She's been performing since she was four years old. She's been writing since she was seven. She started her own record label and publicity firm when she was just 15. She's the former front woman of a major label signed act called Antihero. We're going to talk extensively about that. Uh, and she performed at some incredibly large music festivals, including, for instance, the Canadian Music Week, North by Northeast, the Warp Tour, and a whole bunch of others. Now, in addition to the music, Rose also works fairly regularly as a photography model. She dabbles in graphic and web design, social media management, and publicity. She also has hosted two very popular programs on a local cable outlet, those programs called London's Driven and Mosaic. And more recently, she's been lending her talents to a variety of not-for-profit and community events and activities where you'll often find her as MT, uh, MT, excuse me, MC, (laughs) Places like VegFest London, she's gotten really um, uh, active in that. London Defeat Depression and London's Run for Ovario Cancer. Excuse me. You can tell why I don't work on the radio anymore, right? London's Run for Ovarian Cancer, among many other great causes. More than any of that, she's uh, just become my really good pal, and it was great to see her again. Here is my conversation with Rose Cora Perry. What are your recollections of how we even got in touch with with each other initially? I, from what I recall, I received an email from you. You were promoting an upcoming show. You had heard about me and you asked me to be on the bill. Is that not accurate? I was trying to remember before you got here how I found you or found out about you. Because we'd never knew each other, had heard about each other, anything like that before, right? Well, I think we were in completely different scenes, though, because, I mean, prior to going acoustic, I was really, really heavily just involved in the rock and the grunge punk scene, so I knew nobody who was an acoustic artist because that really wasn't my genre. I was kind of coming out of left field, so I really didn't know anybody. So you get this random email out of nowhere from somebody that's not from the same scene. (laughs) No. (laughs) This guy must be a square. Um, Well, what did you think? What was your reaction to that? 
Um, I consider myself fairly open-minded and always interested in new opportunities and new challenges and like always meet, I I always enjoy meeting new musicians. So I was quite intrigued to learn more about what you were all about and then finding out it was for a good cause. I was definitely on board because I think that music and performance and art has such a, a valuable place in society in terms of really making a difference in people's lives. So I love getting involved in those kind of events. So that was a fun night. That was November of 2010. Mm hmm. Uh, I had released No Schedule Man that summer, and then um, you were just working on promoting off of the pages, right? Yes, I had released it on September 11th. Yeah, you remember one of the things I really remember about that night was um, you were doing one of your songs. If I get this wrong, just reach across and slap me. That can be arranged. <laughs> but you were, I think you were in one of your original songs, and the next thing I knew, you were into Nothing Else Matters by Metallica. Yes, that's my and song, And then you were don't. back into <laughs> one of your own songs again. Is mm-hmm. that accurate? It's 100% accurate. Shootsy scores. <laughs> no, and I, and I didn't, it was one of those things, you know when you go and you see somebody and they get doing something and you know that you've heard it before, but you can't place it? Mm-hmm. And when you got into Nothing Else Matters, I know that that's a light song as far as Metallica is concerned. Right. But that still, I thought that's so badass. Like, <laughs> there was, so there was some badassery inside that acoustic night. But. See, and I think that's the thing. You know, when I when I tried to make an acoustic album, as much as it really was supposed to just be an acoustic album, that badassery really couldn't just stay kind of caged up. It still came out in moments and, and in certain ways that I played the guitar and certain homages that I made. Actually, throughout that whole album, in all of the tracks, there are different homages to different artists that have influenced me. Like, they range all over the place, from Lorena McKennett to the Cardigans to Metallica's You've Picked Up Upon to the Pixies. So, and they're not just um, melodic or lyrical. Some of them are even rhythmic, like there's a Foo Fighters reference. So I just try to be creative with my songwriting and show respect to the people that, who I believe, you know, have made me into the artist that I am. That's cool. That's one of the things I always loved about my favorite band is that they, um, their music is just laced with, like they literally have um, word for word references to lyrics of the Beatles, Alice Cooper, uh, The Who, you know, on and on and on and on and on, um, that you discover who these other artists are Mm -hmm. using that artist kind of as the gateway to it, which is uh, kind of fun. But back to that night when we did that show, for two people that that didn't know each other from a hole in the ground... from different scenes. I, that, that was still one of the most fun uh, events that I've ever had the, the chance to be a part of. And I've done a handful of, not a lot recently, but been in and out of bands and, and whatnot. That, there was something about that night. There was an energy to it that everybody seemed to pick up on. I got just incredible feedback on that night. Why do you think we got along so well and that that just came off so easily? I think we both uh, have a similar mindset in terms of understanding that music is a really, really powerful medium to kind of address messages and social uh, social issues and political issues. And I really admire the fact that you're somebody who's a proponent to try to promote positivity through music and try to promote inspiration. And I very, very much tried to do the same thing. So even though my songwriting often comes from dark and damaged and sad places, I always try to leave people on a hopeful note. And I think that I felt kind of a kinship with you seeing the same thing in, in your songwriting. And I think that we were just feeling off of each other or feeding, sorry, off of each other's energy and each other's vibes. And we could see that in, in each other. I remember there was one song in particular that I did. It's the saddest song or the <laughs> darkest song of that whole set that I was doing, a song called Awake But Not Alive. Mm-hmm. And I did that one. And you came up to me after you said, I really like that once. So, <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. I'm up there going, hope over her, soul over sin. And you're just back there twiddling your thumb. Yeah, that's okay. And then when I'm like, oh, it takes more than a little bit of faith to heal. And you're, oh, I like that one. That one's dark. I think it's because for so long, like I, I truly did really struggle with depression. And so and, did I. And, and music is what honestly helped me get out of that whole state of mind and helped me be able to become, you know, the happy, you know, lighthearted person that I am today. I'm still a serious person by every stretch of the imagination. But I mean, if it weren't for the amazing power of music, I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of self healing. And so I'm still very in touch with my dark emotions because that's always been what I've drawn upon for my, for my inspiration. And it's acted as a catharsis for me. So that's why I'm attracted to that kind of music. And Hmm. my favorite artists write in really, really dark kind of depressing ways, but it's a release for me. It's not that I'm 
re, you know, uh, revisiting my depressive years. It's that listening to that, I can relate to it and I can understand it and feel a sense of resolution, if that makes sense. No, it absolutely does. No, I totally understand what you mean by that. And uh, people that are, are real and have something to say or an observation about a real human experience mm-hmm. appeals to me and will hold my attention so much more than something that is... Shake that ass. <laughs> I was... <laughs> okay, maybe I was that going, was a little too terse. <laughs> I, I was going to say deliberately manufactured to try to have a universal appeal, but sure, shake that ass. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I really synthesized what you were saying Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> into three words I'm fairly effectively. That, yeah, maybe we could collaborate at some point. I can see that my writing would get a lot more efficient. <laughs> Holy cow, you know, she took that song from five and a half minutes down to 30 seconds. <laughs> Well, hey, it'd be a radio hit. All chorus. Yeah, all chorus. We'd just get right to it. But the funny thing is, is even here just laughing about this and sharing these commonalities, unless there is a time that I'm forgetting, and I don't think that there is, this is the first time I've actually seen you in person since the night that we did that show, which was over five years ago. That is correct. So... (laughs) I hope I'm still as exciting. No, but I... I, (laughs) Well, I didn't get to talk to you even this much Mm -hmm. because we both had stuff to do Mm -hmm. that particular night. You showed up. Hey, I'm Kevin. Yeah, I figured that was probably the case. (laughs) And then I was setting up my little merch display. I said I was Kevin. No, I said that. I was, I'm That's my sure, line. Oh, I'm pretty sure that I would have introduced myself as Rose. But I mean, some people do call me Rosa. There is some confusion. I did that. Yeah, you didn't like that. Um, no, I'm because, definitely not freaking Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> Just for the record. There was the one from the stage. I said, Rosa, Cora. And I had the... Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, no, just no. That was the only time that you weren't very happy with me in that particular night. But I remember you had... Um, your merch was in a suitcase. suitcase. <laughs> do you still have that? I do. I thought that was the coolest idea. I inherited... It takes me like an hour and a half to set up. I thought, I'll let you finish your story. Hang on, I'm going to let you finish. <laughs> that... One of the things that I had conceived of before I did No Schedule Man was I'm going to get this whole, like all people do is they just throw a shirt if they even bother to get that out on a table, oh, we buy my stuff. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm going to have like a whole themed area. It's going to be like a little mini Margaritaville, but it's going to be the No Schedule Man trading company. And uh, uh, I had a friend build me a backdrop and then this weird looking tree that was like the open and closed sign and then a special fold out table and I mean it, and I just open a suitcase and everything's there well yeah <laughs> so, already displayed nicely <laughs> here's the part that I didn't think of is lugging all that stuff around yep <laughs> and when you've got to go and actually play a show and you're exhausted from just getting that stuff from the car into the venue mm-hmm. let alone setting it up so that took me I don't know an hour or so and you're like hi I'm Rose click click you're ready to go because your suitcase is open <laughs> see efficiency yeah, where, where clearly I, this is my secret weapon <laughs> where do I plug the guitar in <laughs> I actually inherited that suitcase from my great aunt Fern yes there's something about my family naming people after plants don't ask okay um, and I've uh, I think she used it actually back in the 1960s 60s when she lived in Chicago and she was working in nursing. I was given it, uh, given, um, it was given to me in the early anti-hero days and I used it ever since because it was just, it was a good size. It was very efficient for toting around merchandise and I could easily open it up and everything set up. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I thought it was cool. Well, thank you. But clearly, I still haven't learned my lesson. You need to get a suitcase. What I actually have seen that I think looks really, really badass is um, I've seen metal bands do this. Um, there is a, a style of guitar case called a coffin case where it's supposed to emulate like a casket. Oh, that's dark. And instead of... A little... Well, you know, I'm dark, right? Um, instead of using it as a guitar case to actually tote around their axe, they use it as their merch case. And it looks uh. really, really awesome at shows. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Okay. Using a guitar case. So equally works. I was going to write it down, but then all I have to do is listen back to this. There is that. Yeah. Yeah. The, but now everybody else is going to be able to have that idea too. Way to go, Rose. I know. Gosh. Everybody's going to have a coffin case now. <laughs> well. I want an Aunt I, Fern suitcase. I, okay. I I've only not, ever met one person that has that. I don't work for coffin case. Just to clarify, this is not, you know, some sort of promotional advertisement. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Unless they want to sponsor me. I mean. Well. <laughs> So on that show that we did, and just kind of one more thing on that, and then I've got a lot of other stuff that I want to ask you about while, sure. while I've got you. But the, I've just, I've always thought about it kind of odd that 
because ever since then, I've considered you a good friend. Mm -hmm. Um, But months and maybe even a period of a year or two or more since that time might have gone by with no communication. It's just like a Facebook message, a hey, how are you or whatever else. Mm -hmm. But I've tried to think about other friends that I have that I would view in the same vein as you. Um, I'm not even sure how to kind of form this into a question. It's just sort of like I feel like we're good pals, but we don't even really know each other. We never saw each other for like almost five and a half years. But is that, I don't know, just sort of the transference of soul energy through music and through art, do you think? Or what's your take on it? I think, honestly, people come into each other's lives at certain times to fulfill a purpose. And I really do think that we're attracted to each other because of the energy that we were both putting out there. I think we have a lot of the same shared values. Um, And in my own life, because I'm so busy working all the time, I work multiple jobs as well as trying to make a record and, you know, trying to do various emceeing and donating my time. Truth be told, I honestly don't have much of a social life. I basically have two big parties a year. That's Halloween because Halloween's awesome and my birthday and throughout the rest of the year it's very very minimal times that I actually see my girlfriends but not to say that you're a girlfriend but all of them still right I am fabulous that is true all of them still know how much I love and I value and I cherish them and that in a heartbeat if they needed me I would drop everything to be there for them but it's like I guess sometimes when you have that much of a deep unspoken connection, it's not necessary to be in constant contact. It's just there and you feel like the the relationship is strong enough to survive, you know, months or, or years on end without having extensive relations. Yeah. How do you and, and Ryan, your husband, for mm-hmm. those that don't know Rose, <laughs> um, how much if at all, do you guys work together on some of these creative projects? He's producing my album. Okay. Yeah. Well, I knew that he was a producer Mm -hmm. and, but he and I've never met. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just feel like I know him just through the updates that I see from you and whatever else. But uh, I I wonder how that works where when you have two creative people, it's easy for those who have never tried to actually create something to say, well, it should just be easy. No. (laughs) Okay. So... But it works for you guys. Well, the reason I think it works is because we actually, like you and I, come from completely different genres and different perspectives in terms of musicality. So Ryan actually used to play keyboards in a pop, like, techno kind of band. And so he's coming from a very, very different artistic sensibility, whereas I'm coming from, you know, this heavy, crazy rock and roll stage diving background. And so what happened when we started working on my album together is, you know, I would be laying down the the lead vocals for a track and I'd have an idea for a harmony. He's like, you know what, this is going to sound weird, but I want you to try and sing it this way. And he'd give me like a really, really kind of popified version of what I was doing. I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. But then it would be the, this beautiful thing that magic worked and enhanced my own ideas so I think it worked really well because we're not coming from competitive genres if I was working for example with a lead guitarist that was you know all rock and roll and you know kind of a bit of an egomaniac and try to show me up I think that there would be a sense of animosity Whereas with Ryan, because we're coming from different perspectives, we kind of complement what each other do and he's able to enhance my deficits and vice versa. And so we bring out the best in each other. And I'd say that's kind of accurate of our relationship as well, too, because he's somebody who is very easygoing and likes to definitely relax and a lot, which is fine. But I kick his ass when he needs to get into gear and he helps calm me down when I'm going nuts. So it works out. He, well, see, relaxing is something that I could stand to get some lessons on. Yes, and I needed it too because, I mean, I can be a little stress ball and, you know, I'm not very nice when I'm in that state of mind. Nobody is. And you don't want to, I mean, it's good to work hard. It's good to be passionate and it's good to pursue the things that you really, really care about with your whole heart, but not to the point where you're being detrimental to yourself or others. And I have gotten to that point because I just get so wound up with what I'm doing and I'm feeling overwhelmed. And so he knows how to bring me back a notch and be like, Rose, get a hold of yourself, which is nice. <laughs> How often do you listen to him? I listen to him because yeah. I know he's always looking out for what's best for me and likewise for him. I mean, we have, as I said, a, a good solid understanding and relationship and we complement each other because we come from different perspectives. Yeah, that's cool. Mm-hmm. It's um, it's nice. It's nice to actually be happily married. <laughs> it's a really, really awesome, awesome thing to be able to say. Well, I think it takes awareness and it sounds like you've been working on that. And, uh, you know, I tried it once and got it wrong. <laughs> 
but a lot of people do, right? Absolutely. And, and I don't even really know that you can class. That's part. You know what? I, I'll take it back that that's part of the old script. If you got it, you know what? I learned things through going through divorce that I don't think I could have learned any other way. Right. Uh, my kids and I were always close. We're closer now because mm-hmm. of the way that things are. Uh, and while you were describing just Ryan relaxing and sort of bringing you back, it's funny, just the other night, my sweetheart Caroline was over here. And when she and I get together mm-hmm. on the rare occasions when there aren't kids involved, that's about the only time when I ever sit on the couch in that room opposite of us is to, to, for more than 15 minutes at a time. Right. Because time with her and time with my two boys are is off limits to right. everything else. Right. The trick is finding that time as, in the midst of life just as it naturally happens with the jobs and with just doing you know fun stuff like laundry and dishes and meals and you know responsibility i know adulting is hard i know (laughs) and then um when you decide on top of that i think i'll start a podcast i think i'll release an album i think i'll be a speaker i think i'll mc events i think i'll do some modeling tell me about it i'm mixing interests between me and rose you can decide which ones are maybe exclusive to one or the other obviously he's the model oh yeah well goes without saying Look at that profile. I had, you know what? I just, we were talking about Seinfeld before we started recording, and I just had a mental image of uh, the George Costanza. Nice. (laughs) Sex appeal at its finest. And then a desperate attempt to change the subject. (laughs) I want to get to the album that you've got coming up. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, let's set the table because I never actually did talk to you about. We're actually at a table now. I offered you some things and you said you didn't want any. So now you're stuck because you got to keep talking. I want to talk about her Mm -hmm. and anti-hero. Okay. Which came first? Her. Tell me about that. So it was basically four girls in high school that did not know how to play their instruments and got together and formed a band. You were the Sex Pistols, <laughs> Pretty but much. females. Yes. But they've all... <laughs> um, and it actually formed in a really, really odd way. Uh, I was still undergoing my vocal training at that point, so most people that have followed me kind of know that I went through the Royal Conservatory and I did 14 years of operatic and Broadway and all these different vocal training, and I got my grade two in theory, grade seven in music so I was actually performing think of me from the phantom of the opera at a local talent show and this girl that I didn't know but was friends with a mutual friend of ours came up to me and said I play guitar let's form a band I'm like I was so prissy back then thinking please I'm gonna be on Broadway why would I want to form a rock band but you know I kind of got coaxed into giving it a try because I really really cared about the other girl that we were mutual friends with and she was like gung-ho about playing bass and then we found somebody who was going to learn how to play drums for the purposes of the band and so we got together and we started out just kind of rocking out covers and really getting a feel for doing rock and roll and admittedly I'd never sang rock in my life so I had no idea what I was doing I was at first sounding too pretty and then I tried to compensate by sounding too nasally and it just it was an interesting project I mean I definitely learned a lot along the way in fact one of the most valuable things I learned out of that project was how to play guitar because prior to that I had never picked up really any instrument seriously in my life I toyed around with violin god that was terrible uh I tried cello I tried stand-up bass I tried piano a bit but nothing really stuck and nothing really kind of hit me on the same level because I've always considered myself a vocalist. That is my instrument. That's what I work to really, really feel confident about and really kind of master my own sound. And I've never really been passionate about, you know, backing myself up in any capacity. It kind of all happened, to be honest, because I got in a fight with the guitarist in the band (laughs) over songwriting. Um, She was a good guitarist, but she couldn't write songs structured to vocals. Like we just did not know, know how exactly to what make it work and it was not working. And so basically after this fight that we got into, I went home that day. Well, I went to a store first and then I went home. I went to a store, picked up an acoustic guitar and literally I'm not exaggerating. I practiced for six hours a day to the point that my fingers bled for six months. And I wrote that whole album in those six months and I'd never played guitar in my life. How did you, or where did you settle on, I'm not ignoring the guitar thing, Yep. Um, but what you said about the vocals of sounding nasally one right. moment and then the other way the next, Right. where did you eventually settle on? I don't think I did. 
honest to God, that album is very, very inconsistent. And I mean, it's my first band. It's my first project. And I think that it's very, very apparent at times I'm struggling with myself and kind of competing with myself. At times I'm trying to sound pretty. At times I'm trying to sound like I'm rock and roll and I really don't know what I'm doing. So I would say that I did not establish my sound as a singer until I really got into the anti-hero days. But that's also a rock sound versus what I'm doing now, I think kind of is an amalgamation of all the different backgrounds that I've had. And I feel like now I've really found myself as a vocalist in terms of what style I wanted to do, but it took a long, long journey to get here. And I had some bumps along the way in order to figure that out. Yeah. That's completely understandable. And then back (laughs) anti-hero. Well, then back to where you left with the guitar. Yes. Um, six months, six hours a day, bloody fingers, lovely image. Yeah. It's pretty awful. But that's what happens. Um, for anybody that's never picked up the guitar before, go just even press the strings down for a oh, while. Yeah. Hold it like that for a couple minutes and see how the ends of your fingers feel. Yep. Now do that for a couple hours. For sure. And, and I uh, specifically chose an acoustic guitar to learn and to write all my songs on, knowing that the fretboard was wider and the strings were thicker, so it would be harder to play than electric. Yeah. I did that intentionally. And ever since, every song I've ever written in my life has always been on acoustic first. Really? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I've never written anything on an electric. So did you uh, always play guitar at some level then from that point on? Um, I basically wrote that album and I kind of, uh, upon occasion would make appearances as a rhythm guitarist in her, but I definitely was not playing on a regular basis. It was usually only for like one or two songs in a set, even though I wrote the songs myself. Um, in the anti-hero days, it definitely, I became more of a prominent rhythm guitarist, but still I was not the lead guitarist. I was the songwriter and rhythm guitarist because I've never considered myself a guitarist. I play the guitar to back up my vocals. That's kind of how um, I envision of the definition because I certainly am no, you know, Angus Young being able to rip off these awesome leads and riffs and everything, but I've also never aspired to do that. So it's kind of transitioned and it's become more and more and more prominent. And it's actually really, really hilarious to me to now be in a band uh, embarking on this new exciting album that I'm going to be releasing in a couple months where I'm the only guitarist in the band because we're a three piece. It's so weird for me to be in this position to know that I'm the only one playing guitar now. I can't rely on anybody else. So I really actually have to get my shit together. <laughs> and are you, well, I know you're pleased with it so far because I've read some of the interviews that you've mm-hmm. done and you're really excited about this project, but we're skipping ahead, but you're really excited about this project. I am you? very, very excited. And I'm sorry for skipping ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> there are no rules. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this. So as far as anti-hero, basically what happened is, um, her disbanded, not under great circumstances. How long did her last? About four years. Well, that's a pretty good run, especially when both you're in your my teens. Bands, both my bands lasted the same time period. Four really? Years. Yep. Huh. And it's like the, it was the kiss of death for both of them after the four year span. So I'm hopeful that, you know, I'll be able to do better as a solo artist with this new band that I've got together. But yeah, four years has been kind of the time limit that I've had. So basically what happened to make a long story short without getting into the gory, dramatic high school bullshit details is that the girls decided instead of pursuing music um, seriously as I had intended on doing, they wanted to do the practical thing and go to school. You know, tears were cried. There were screaming matches and it ended badly. So after that... uh, I love how, sorry to interrupt you, but I love how you you said they wanted to do the practical thing and go to school as if it's just an abhorrent suggestion to you. You They wanted to go and get educated. Ooh, shiver. And I say that as somebody who has six years of post-secondary too. uh, My my mom and dad were and are always the best. And the one... (laughs) The one time I can remember mom really not being in support of my present at that time life path was when I was in a high school band and uh, had decided that, you know what, this school thing isn't for me. I'm going to go off and just be a rock musician. And yeah, that didn't get... uh, that didn't get a hundred percent endorsement. I have no yeah. doubt that there was parental influence in terms of the decision. It just, to me, it was a real shame because we had built up all this hype. We actually had label interest. And I mean, I will be the first to admit, honestly, because we were so new and so green with the whole experience of being in a band. And, you know, many of us learned our instruments for the, the first time in that style of music, myself included. 
we really weren't that great in terms of musicality, but we had an awesome image. We had a good following. People really liked the energy at our shows. We choreographed yeah. stupid little dance moves. Like it was cutesy and it was fun and we had interest and, you know, I was really excited thinking like my perspective was that we just released this album. We're going to go on tour, see where it goes, see what it can become. They all decide they're going to do the practical thing. So I was left pretty heartbroken at the end of the, the whole circumstance. Right. And I mean, I don't blame them. Everybody has their own life path and that's fine. I, I still wish those girls well. And I hope that they're happy with, you know, how life has taken them on their different respective journeys. But it wasn't enough for me to give up there. I felt like I still had more rock and roll in me to express. Um, and how anti hero came to be, it was a random, I was postering an ad for her, one of hers final shows downtown on a street lamp. And this guy who I guess had scoped me out at college was across the street doing the same thing. He ended up becoming my lead guitarist and anti-hero. He came over, saw me putting up a show, a poster, gave me one of his, said, I'll go to your show if you go to mine. You know, like the, the typical musician networking thing goes. Yep. Uh, we got to know each other. We kind of started dating and seeing each other. And um, her broke up at the same time that his project that he was previously in broke up too. And so he really, really had to talk me into it because I was pretty upset about how the whole her thing fell apart. But eventually he twisted my arm enough. He's like, let's form a band together. I really think that we could work well together. And we did. What happened basically is I would write the structures of these songs and I would play them for him. And because he came from an industrial and metal background, he was able to take what I did and kind of rearrange it so that it would work for this new sort of genre that we were getting together. And then we met our, um, we met the bassist at a Marilyn Manson concert <laughs> and the first drummer was just recruited basically, basically via a classified ad. And so we all got together and just the, the sound morphed and morphed and morphed. And eventually we became, I guess what was called a grunge band or a hard rock grunge sort of band. Um, and when I was in the anti-hero days, I was playing rhythm guitar for, I'd say, probably 85, 90% of the time for the, for the live performances. But I still very, very much felt more comfortable when I was just rocking the microphone and being able to be more energetic and enthusiastic with the crowd and do things like stage dive because it's just, I wanted just to focus on my vocals and just be a front woman. But That's how you focus on your vocals is diving off the stage? Obviously. <laughs> Well, I, I just, I wanted to focus, I guess I should say on just being an awesome front woman and just, you know, really, really getting the crowd all jazzed up to I it. I know and what you mean. We were very, very obnoxious. I mean, our shows regu regularly included FU chants where we'd get the whole crowd <laughs> into it. We got banned from the whole state of Missouri. We got banned by the governor of um, Halliburton County. And I mean, for a punk or a grunge band, those are bragging rights. That's not something to be ashamed of. <laughs> So that was all well, fun, good, good stuff. Um, basically, that band fell apart um, for different reasons, but what ended up... Well, you didn't have anywhere else left to play. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> uh, we were actually doing pretty well. We were touring around, doing a lot of really cool things like Warp Tour, getting some awesome shows in the States, and you know, had some great opportunities coming uh, going on, but the first drummer decided for whatever reason he just wasn't happy with the direction of the band anymore. Uh, kind of started to have beef with, uh, with people in the band. And so he decided to depart two days before we had a major showcase at North by Northeast. Oh. So you can imagine at this point, I'm like ripping my hair out thinking, how the F could you do this to us? Like, this is a huge deal. Like if you ever cared about the band, could you not just wait at least till the showcase is over? Come on. Luckily, Within those two days, we were able to recruit somebody and train them to the bare minimum that we could pull off the actual showcase. But after that point, the band really lost steam because the original drummer, um, despite his flaws, was a heck of a drummer. And he really, really, really knew how to enhance the songs in terms of the rhythms and the beats that he came up with. And it was mm -hmm. just never the same without him. It wasn't the same mentality. It wasn't the same... Um, just atmosphere. And so we did still continue to tour with this new fellow that we had recruited, but he was really more of a, a session player, if you will, as opposed to being a full on band member. And we had intended on putting out another record. We got signed and picked up 
and I had worldwide distribution, all these wonderful things going on. And I had actually, I still have it written a whole second anti-hero record, but it never saw the light of day because I think we just ran out of steam. We got, I got sick personally of singing. I feel so damn unpretty <laughs> for like the 500th time. And there was all these unnecessary delays with us being able to go back into the studio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it just ended up falling apart. And I mean, on top of that, there were also band members that will remain nameless who got into drugs, which created other issues. And I've always been a very, very, very strong advocate for anti-drug use. So I'm sure you can appreciate how that became a conflict. Yeah. And Sorry, that was very long-winded. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's uh, well. It was. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good story. And I mean, these are scars that are hard earned, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it amazes me as a fan of music how any group is able to sustain itself with the, the core group of, of members for any length of time. Mm-hmm. And those that have been together a long, long time you, you, if you just think about friendships and relationships and being close to somebody, coworkers, people that you see every day or every other day or something for a long, how difficult it is to, you know, even just want to be around that person all the time. Right. That for those that have never had the experience, and, and I haven't ever had anything near that level, what you just described, but I've been in bands mm-hmm. and it, there's just, it's, it's tough, A... To find the right mix. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, it's tough, actually, before A, what comes before A, <laughs> to even find people capable of filling the roles. Yes. And then if you can do that, to have the right personality mix is a bonus. And then if that personality mix can actually bring something and their talent to whatever the sound of the this particular project and somebody's always driving the thing oh, every group always has to have a, and I'm not when I Needs say a group leader. yeah it uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's music or sports or any other kind of organization a community group a, a board of directors somebody's always driving the boat mm-hmm. it's always like that and they're the one who gets all the accolades but at the same time if shit goes wrong they're the one who gets all the well, shit yeah you're the and con- that was always me i was the yeah, kicking bag it's like this uh well what are we going to do next rose or when's our next gig going to be rose or what are we going to do at the studio or what are we going to do with this or, you're a control freak rose back exactly, off rose like exactly. why can't you just relax rose that was exactly it so yeah. at the same time that I was designated with all this responsibility, which I took on myself admittedly because I had a skill for it, doing all the publicity, doing all the booking, doing all the promotions, you know, writing all the songs, all that wonderful stuff. I was happy to do it because clearly, you know, I was able to do it at the same time as that was appreciated. If the the slightest thing went wrong, I mean, I'm like the worst Nazi from hell and God, you know, I'm such a terrible person. It was just, it was always one extreme or another. And being in a band is honestly like being in a very, very, very dysfunctional relationship because you have extreme highs together but then you also have extreme lows together but something interesting as we were having this conversation and I'm reliving these (laughs) these moments in my life something interesting just actually occurred to me right now all right in both my band projects as I've just relayed to you I was not really a willing participant in both of them my arm had to be twisted whereas this is the first time in my life I formed a band on my own terms well, that's interesting. It is interesting. But that plays back to what we were talking about. I think before we hit record, so it's absolutely useless to people that are listening <laughs> to this. But no, we were talking about just following the script of what you think you're supposed to do. Yes. And when you don't have any frame of reference, mm-hmm. you don't know any better because you've got nothing to compare it to. For sure. But once you have a couple of experiences like that, aha, uh-huh, now you know, you've know you detonated a few landmines and you start to get a little bit of an idea of where they might be, Mm -hmm. but you can't possibly know what you just described without, without having going through it. Yeah. And I don't regret either the her or the antihero experiences. I mean, obviously, as I said, neither band really ended very well and I'm very sad about that stuff. I always will be. I mean, it will hold a dear place in my heart. Those are experiences that were very, very meaningful and, and, uh, 
caused me to mature and grow a lot. And I went through a lot. And I mean, my songwriting too reflects that what I was experiencing at the time came out in the lyrics that I was writing about. Um, but at the same time, I mean, there were some good memories about those things too. I mean, I can think of hilarious, just ridiculous experiences. So it's not all bad. It's not all good. It's just, they were experiences in general. They, they caused me to reassess my life, reassess my situation, think about things in a different way. And if anything, I have to credit them with the fact that they allowed me to find myself truly as an artist, Yeah, which I think is a huge, huge thing. So if I didn't have those past experiences, I probably would have ended up doing the New York Broadway thing, never realizing that for some reason there's this rock and roller in me with this DIY punk attitude that just will not shut up until she's heard. What do you think about that of, do you have regret about not having tried the Broadway thing? Um, a part of me does because it would have been, I mean, my mom, I'm sure probably... <laughs> Would have loved for well, no, me. But you're to... very theatrical and you were involved in some theater here locally a I couple was. of years ago, right? I was. And it's funny too, because when I was in high school, like I always was complimented for having this fantastic voice and all this power because I'm a tiny little thing, but I'm very, very strong with my voice because I trained for many, many years, but I was also actually very self-conscious about my acting. Um, and so I never really pursued it seriously, never thinking I was any good. And then I find out maybe I actually do have a talent for this. So, I mean, I think that life goes in kind of the direction that it's supposed to, for whatever reason, to teach you valuable lessons along the way and really ultimately help you find yourself. So I think maybe in another life that could have been me, but for whatever reason for this life, it's, it's not right. Or who knows, maybe when I'm 60, I will be up there rocking it Judy Garland style. You never know, never close the door on opportunities, but it hasn't worked out thus far, but that doesn't mean it's not possible in the future. I can see you writing your own show. I and thought then, about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it doesn't surprise me. From her to anti-hero, and I'm yes. just you know picturing all of the bombastic experiences <laughs> um, to all the way down. I'll, tell, I'll tell you one funny story from my, my touring days so okay. that it doesn't sound like I'm completely negative about it. Okay, so one of the last anti-hero tours, we had our bandwagon, Ace Ventura, and <laughs> it was this old... Alrighty then. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it was this old, ugly, brown, 1988 Chevy conversion van where parts of it just didn't really quite want to function the way that they were supposed to. Anyways... We're coming around the bend about to get onto the ramp to go onto the highway in the States and the car completely stalls out. Like it just turns off and we can't slow down at this point because we're about to merge into oncoming traffic. Luckily, we were going fast enough that there was enough speed behind the vehicle for us to successfully merge and we cranked the engine a couple times. We're able to get it to restart and just kept driving. It was awesome. <laughs> Ace Ventura. Yes. <laughs> a living legend. Well, he's dead now. He uh, he gave his last plume of black smoke several years ago, but it was interesting. It's funny how you survive stuff like that. I know. You know and you just keep <laughs> Completely going. Completely nuts, right? <laughs> yeah. No. Well, I'm glad Ace Ventura didn't let you down. Not he that, didn't. Not that time. He revived his spirit that one last time when he knew we needed us. So <laughs> it was good. So from all of that and all the craziness and the zaniness and the different people and the volume and the festivals and the shows and the, the FU chants and yes, um, many of the, those. Uh, the being unwelcome in Halliburton and having your face posted at the border of Missouri, show me state. No, not her. Don't show us those guys. Down to nothing but you and the guitar for yes. off of the pages. Tell me how that came together. Um, basically after all of the band stuff, I really, really was intent on never getting in another band again. I was honestly so heartbroken over everything that had happened with both the bands. Like, I mean, in the first one, I, I lost my best friend from high school. Like the relationship just completely crumbled as a consequence of that band falling apart. And an anti-hero, though I never really spoke about it publicly much, the lead guitarist and I were involved for, for quite some time, almost a decade, in fact, romantically, as well as being songwriting partners. And so it wasn't just a matter of the band breaking up and, and being devastated, but our relationship ended, and it ended very badly. Mm. Um, 
suffice it to say, let's just say that there were drugs and mistresses and a whole bunch of stuff going on that I was completely oblivious to because I was so madly in love with that man. Um, and my heart was completely, utterly destroyed. I honestly didn't think I was going to survive that breakup. It was that traumatic for me. Hmm. So what happened is I took off out of the city for a couple of months and I just needed to mentally unwind and find myself again. I went and lived with my mom and I just, I needed to get back to a place where I could be okay and be stable. And in that process, you know, again, because music has been so um, central in my life in terms of dealing with emotions that are beyond me and that I don't know how to, how to deal with productively. I ended up picking up a guitar and writing a heck of a lot of songs and just trying to get that stuff out of me. I actually also wrote a book about my whole experience. Um, I never released it, but it was just a matter of dealing with those emotions in a positive way, right? Not becoming an alcoholic, not becoming a drug addict, not turning to a vice to deal with all this pain that, and heartbreak that I was dealing with, but trying to get it out of my system in a way that other people could relate to and be like, wow, I've gone through something similar. I get her. She gets me. And I'm okay now because I've heard that. Because that's what artists for me have always done. And that's why music has always been so powerful for me. So I got that stuff out of my system. And the reason that Off of the Pages is kind of scattered and kind of weird and kind of raw and kind of organic is because when I recorded it, I was still in such a mentally unwound place that there's no way I could have done a polished studio album. It just was not in the cards for me. So instead I literally just picked up my guitar and I sang and played every single song on that live off the floor, no click. And it's the rawest and most vulnerable I think I've ever been in my life. There are parts where my voice cracks a bit because I started crying and breaking down in the middle, but I just kept going because that was the only way I knew how to deal with all those things I was facing at the time. That was the time when you and I met. It was. That's interesting, Mm because I was just about to go through the fire, and you were already, uh, you'd already run through it, and we're still trying to... Trying, trying to recover. Yeah. Well, it's a process, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that, um, uh, Rose has a copy of my EP, Solo, The Return of No Schedule Man. The the name of that uh, is like that for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, There is a little bit of instrumentation on it, but it's pretty much all, I didn't... There were no other musicians involved other than me and then the fellow that, that helped me produce it, Tim Schwinn, a fantastic guy, and deliberately came back and did that show on my own, just me and my guitar, because it was, uh, and then the whole return of, we talked about it before we started recording, it was uh, more a process of just even showing, okay, Kevin, you're still there, and yeah. whatever is your spark that's inside you, it's it's not a roaring fire like it used to be, but the pilot light's still on. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the music kind of drove me back to that. And then after I did it and I did the one show, I'm like, okay, I'm good now. <laughs> Go and do some other stuff. Whereas you have continued to drive forward. And I know I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, but I, I, we've been, if you can believe it, we've been talking for three quarters of an hour and we haven't even got to, me. um, <laughs> to, the, the floor. The, yeah, to the current project because this one is different from any of the others it is. that we've talked about. Tell me how. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, for starters, as I said, I formed a band on my own, you know, merits and my own desires, which is something I've never done and yeah, never, but, never but, thought I wanted to but do. But maybe explain why. Well, that's exactly what I was about to get to. Okay. So, sorry. <laughs> forgot my place. <laughs> so onto the floor was actually the reason it's named onto the floor is because if you listen to the opening track of off of the pages, I say I wore my heart out on my sleeve off of the pages and onto the floor. It was supposed to be self-referential to my former solo album because they were supposed to be linked together and they were supposed to be of a same kind of experience. Whereas off of the pages was really, really raw and organic and dealing with those emotions when I was in this crazy mental mindset trying to overcome sadness and, and overcome yet again depression coming back into my life. Whereas Onto the Floor was written from more of a stance of revolution and resolution and finding myself again and finding a sense of confidence and power and feeling like I've been able to master myself and master these experiences and get to a place of emotional maturity and personal growth where I'm okay. 
I've gone through some crappy things in my life. We all have, but guess what? I'm not a victim. I survived them. And that was the key thing, establishing that different mindset. But with that said, I still really wanted to give it a delicate approach when I initially had written all the songs. And I mean, the bare bones acoustic versions of the songs do have a similar feel to off of the pages. But when I started working on it, (laughs) well, I started thinking, hmm, distortion might really sound awesome there. Like, I'm not going to lie. And oh, I've got this idea. How would that sound if maybe I collaborated with a pianist? So then I get in touch with this amazingly talented classical jazz pianist, and we start working on my songs together and coming up with arrangements that I couldn't have even imagined. And it just kind of started becoming its own entity onto itself. So my intentions, whatever they were for the album, I was no longer in control. The universe was dictating to me. I was making something that was going to be an epic beast onto itself. And I didn't really know how it was going to turn out, but I had to keep following it and I had to just let it happen organically because to me that's how the best art is made you just allow it to have its natural raw process and just allow it to grow so that's exactly what happened and what ended up happening is it got so big (laughs) and so epic with all this different instrumentation that after listening to you know the preliminary mixes with my producer aka my husband ryan I realized there was no way in hell I'd be able to pull off any of this stuff live with an acoustic guitar. Damn it, I'm going to have to form a band. But how do I do this? You know, I've had such terrible experiences with bands. How do I go about, you know, trying to make it right this time? And I'm happy to say that I have had a wonderful experience this time. Wonderful experience working on the album, which is the first, because I usually hate being in the studio. It's just been so amazing seeing it grow and seeing it develop and really having Ryan challenge me because he knows what I'm capable of as a singer and he refuses to accept anything less than my best which is good I like that it's it's forcing me to really really concentrate really really do an awesome job and it's wonderful to be just working with people in general that are being so supportive and and so loving and so respectful and just getting my vision as opposed to in my past band experiences and my past songwriting experiences where it was always surrounded by some sort of torment or anguish or fighting. This is all positive and it's all supportive and it's all loving and it's just, it's a complete 180 from anything I've experienced before. And so to me, that's the universe telling me I must be on the right track and I'm hoping that the success of it will indicate just that. Two things real quick, Rose. One, you saw I reached for the pen there. I just wrote down Epic Beast <laughs> to add to my band names list. Nice. <laughs> that's the second time in three podcasts that that's uh, happened. The other is Unscripted Doofus. That came up in the first one. <laughs> um, the other is, it was funny, I almost was going to say, I need you to get a little closer to the mic. You're fine, but what I'm getting at is when you started talking about this project, your entire body language changed. Mm-hmm. You sat up straighter. Your eyes are dancing around. <laughs> you, still, you still have that, you know, shit eating grin on your face. <laughs> it's not to say that you weren't happy when you were describing the others, but you just lit up when you were talking about this project. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything, your whole physiology changed. Mm-hmm. And so that tells me that you really are on to something that I is so. <laughs> right for where you are. And it. Is this the first musical project that you and Ryan have worked on together of this scale? Yes. So that probably doesn't hurt either, right? We've never worked together on a project before because, as I said, we came from completely different genres. And we only met when I was actually in the process of finishing up off of the pages. Okay. So even that... Is you know, you're taking one of the, if not the best thing in your life and infusing it into something else that you're passionate about. Mm-hmm. And you're having those sparks going off that aren't always born of agreement. Yeah. <laughs> which can be very productive as you've outlined. It is. It is productive. And so coming from the place that you described with, you know, anti-hero and how that ended and what the costs were and whatever else, and then paying your tuition between that and the time where you are now, mm-hmm. um, it's really exciting for me to see you so happy with it. <laughs> it's it's nice to, for once in my life, actually be happy and to be releasing a record that it's not full of negativity. It's not full of hating the world. 
it's full of actually a sense of resolution. I mean, obviously there are still some songs where you can clearly hear I'm working through things still. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, there are some things, some experiences in life that will scar you forever that you never entirely get over, but you can work and you can chip away at it a little bit each day and try and grow and try and become stronger and try and become a better version of yourself and take those lessons that you were given and not take anything for granted. But it's nice to, as I said, to be coming from a positive stance and and really being excited in a different kind of way to put this music out there. And all I can hope is that it at least resonates with one person. So what are your plans around this when it comes out? I would like to tour <laughs> and I would like to release a couple YouTube music videos and it would be awesome if somebody wants to play the record on the radio. I mean, we live in a completely different era now in terms of the music industry. It is based so much on social media, which to me is completely ridiculous because just because you have 50,000 fans or likes on Facebook, no way dictates that you're playing to that many people on a given night or that you didn't buy those fans because guess what? There are many vehicles through which you can do that, mm -hmm. but don't let me start with the bitching because um, I won't shut up about that. All Sounds I'm like <laughs> we're gearing up for episode two. Yeah. All I'm saying is that we, we live in a very, very different era now musically, yeah. and really it's hard to predict the success of anything that you put out there because we are so oversaturated by good, bad, and freaking terrible. Uh, <laughs> and anybody can put out anything that they want, and even the most ridiculous things that have no merit and no value can skyrocket and become viral, right? To me, it's completely nonsensical, a lot of it. So I'm putting it out there. I... I'm really proud of it. I think that it reflects me coming full circle of all the experiences that I've had as a rocker, as an acoustic performer, as a classically trained girl who once uh, at one point in her life wanted to be on Broadway. I think it's everything that I am and I think it's authentic and I think it's actually positive and I'm really hoping, as I said, all I can hope is that it resonates with people if it changes one person's life, I've accomplished my mission. When are you hoping that it'll be out? <laughs> it's always a contentious question to ask well, somebody. Well, and keep in mind, somebody might be listening to this on SoundCloud or iTunes in you know, 2022. Like, so it might have already been certified platinum several times. That so. would be awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping for May, but again, this is not something that I really want to rush. Good for it's you. a matter of it'll be done when I feel that it's the best it can be. I come from an era where it was not abnormal by any stretch of the imagination to wait five, even seven years between albums because the artists then had the opportunity to really work through all their material, make sure it was the strongest material that they could write, the best arrangements that they could write, as opposed to living in an era where you're expected to put out a new single every three months or your old news. I don't buy into that crap. I would rather put out something that is a good record front to back as opposed to just be a one hit wonder. I just got told <laughs> her body language changed again. Yeah. Sorry, that was a little bitchy. <laughs> no, she just was sort of leaning across the table like, don't even. <laughs> so, okay, I agree with you, Rose, please. <laughs> we, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I will detract the claws. <laughs> no, well, you know I'm a huge fan and uh, I'm here to do whatever I can to support you. And of course, uh, Ryan as well. There are so many things that we haven't touched on. Um, will you come back and do this again at some point down the road? Because I, I wanted to ask you about modeling. I wanted to ask you about VegFest. I wanted to ask you about your MC work. And more mm. importantly, just some of the things that, that make you tick. Um, <laughs> but if we continue to do that, we're going to be another hour. And nobody will ever get through this this podcast. So we'll, we'll do it again sometime. But Awesome. Uh, when I started this, this was on my list of things to do only because I wanted to do it. And if anybody enjoyed listening to it, that's just a bonus. After I did the first podcast with my friend Derek, I literally thought, I'm good now. I've done it. I'm having so much fun. I don't really even care if anybody else likes it. Right. As it turns out, I've had more positive feedback just on doing this than a lot of other things I've, I've tried, which is ironic because it was the thing I cared about the least if other people did like it. Mm -hmm. So I'm still trying to reconcile with things going forward. <laughs> but as I got into it, um, I was making lists, even just thinking of what I wanted it to be and how I wanted it to, to work and, and maybe sound, making lists of people that I thought would be interesting that, um, that I wanted to reach out to quickly. And yours was always in the top like five of, of all of those lists. And, and I right away thought I have got to get, you know, a strong 
female <laughs> that has something to say in here early in or the maybe going. maybe too much to say. <laughs> no, not that at all. But I, I mean this as a, as a very sincere compliment. Yours, when I thought of it that way, uh, because I don't want people to be shy about coming and sharing their stories. There always needs to be somebody to go first. Mm-hmm. And uh, yours was the first name that would always come to mind. And uh, of, of course, you didn't disappoint me with, uh, with your story. So thank you so much for doing this. And I really hope that we can do it again. And thank you. And I'm very, very flattered to hold such high regard in your eyes. Look for On to the Floor from Rose Cora Perry and The Truth Untold later this year. You can stay up to date with her at rosecoraperry.com. You can find all her social media links there. And Rose is very active on social media. Great follow, a terrific connection. I encourage you to reach out to her. You'll be glad that you did. As for me, you can join me online at kevinbulmer.com. My last name is B as in Bob, U-L-M as in Mary, E-R, kevinbulmer.com. If it's easier, you can also use noscheduleman.com. That goes to the same place, and it's easier to remember. Stay in touch by signing up for my uh, semi-regular e-newsletter. It's free. It's free partially because it only goes out on a very semi-regular basis. (laughs) You can subscribe to our YouTube channel or join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or SoundCloud. They're all at or backslash no schedule man and of course all my links are on the website as well you can download this podcast to your ipod or mp3 player to be able to listen to it at your convenience you can find that at soundcloud.com slash no schedule man if you like the show leave us a comment give us a like tell a friend if you hated the show leave us a comment tell a friend i guess you'll leave out the like hey thanks again so much for listening we'll catch you next time on the no schedule man podcast Thank you.